Okay, so in the last video, I took a spring, this in fact spring, actually this one, and I, I stretched it with some weights to find the model for the force due to a spring. And in fact, I got this model. I said the uh, force due to the spring is negative K times the magnitude of L minus L0 times L hat. So in this case, K is the stiffness of the spring. And I measured that by, by uh, stretching at different distances and finding the force, and I got 5.16 newtons per meter. L is the vector from the beginning of the spring to the end of the spring. L0 is the unstretched length of the spring. And so this is the magnitude. So I take the difference in these two, and that gives me the, the value for S. And then L hat is a unit vector in the direction of the spring to make this a vector. And so the negative sign means that if it's stretched this way, the force pulls back that way. So what happens if I put a mass on here, uh, let's just, and stretch it down over to here, some value, then what forces are acting on it? Well, I have the gravitational force pulls down, and then the spring force pulls up. And the spring force is going to be greater than the gravitational force if I pull this down. Let's just say that it is. So then I can say F net equals Fs plus mg. And it's plus because g is the, vec the gravitational field vector. It has a negative y component, but we still add the, com the vectors this way. And this is going to be equal to delta p over delta t, the change in momentum with respect to the change in time. Now, I could, if I, you know, could I find the change of momentum for this based on that equation? And the answer is not really, okay? Not really, because let's think about what happens. If this is true and it starts at P equals zero, the initial momentum P zero equals the zero vector. Kilogram meters per second. Then as, that means that in a little bit time later, it's going to have an upward momentum because the net force is up, and so it's going to move up and speed up. But the force now is going to change because it moved. So now uh, if what the position changes, then L changes. And if L changes, the force changes. So this is a really tough problem to model. And so we're, in, we're not going to do it on paper. We're going to do it numerically. So I've already done some uh, an introduction to numerical calculations. I'll show you that link down here. That's where the bottom is. Uh, so instead, we're going to do this in Python. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to start off. Uh, I'm going to actually call this y equals zero right up here. Okay. And then I'm going to have a mass down here. And I'm actually going to make this uh, using a visual Python. So step one is set up initial conditions. So that's all this stuff, you know, the mass, the spring, the constants, all that. Then I'm going to make a time of zero and a time step of, let's say, 0 0.01. And I'll do a loop for, let's say, four seconds. I'll put loop right here, and we'll talk about that in the code. And then in the loop, the first thing I'm going to do is use the, the, the position to calculate the force. So I'm going to say F net equals... Uh, Fs plus mg. And so this, I'm going to need to know where the mass is and how far the spring is stretched to find this. So there's a little bit more steps here, but we're going to do that anyway. Next, I will use this force and this momentum to find the change momentum. I've already talked about the momentum update formula. So if I solve this for P2, this is equal to P2 minus P1 over delta T. And if you solve that for P2, I get P2 equals P1 plus F net delta T. So if I know the momentum and I calculate the force, I can find the new momentum. Now I'm going to use the definition of average velocity to find the new position using the position update formula. And again, I talked about this in my previous video. So this would be R2 equals R1, where this is the position. So this is actually going to be 
Um, this could be the R vector, but I'm actually going to write calculate L in terms of R, and I'll do that in the code. But let's just call this R1 plus P2 over M delta T. So I'm going to use the momentum I just calculated instead of the average velocity, divide by the mass to get the, the velocity, and then use that to find the new position. And then finally, I'll update time, T2 equals T1 plus delta T. And then I'll go back up here to loop and keep doing that for four seconds or something like that. And that's the idea of a numerical calculation. So I'm going to do that over there. Um, I wanted to get this set up so you can think about the, how we'd put these equations into Python. Um, and one more thing. So what I want to do, and I'm going to show you this next, is I want to connect this to reality. So if I take this mass and pull it down and let go, it's going to oscillate up and down. And I can, if I take the time it takes to go up and all the way back down to the starting position, we're going to call that t the period. If I measure the period experimentally and then I calculate it this way, those two things should agree. And if they agree, then that's a good program. That's a good model. Okay, so I'm going to show you that real quick, and then we're going to switch over to my computer over there, and then we'll, we'll code this in, and it's going to be awesome. Okay, you took too long to get over here, so I started without you. I apologize, but not really. Okay, I already entered in some stuff in here in my model. I just made these two lines right here make a graph. Uh, that makes the, the axis and stuff like that, and this is going to make the, uh, the curve. I put in the mass. I have the gravitational field G. This top is the top part where the top of the spring is connected. This is the length of the spring unstretched. That's it. That's the spring constant. Now I actually do need to put where the mass is, so I'm going to have that as R. So let's put this like the following. Uh, I want it to be at R equals uh, the, let's see, so I'm going to say R is equal to top Right, because I want to add, take that top and then add a vector on top of that. And I'm going to say plus vector zero negative, um, I'm going to stretch it a centimeter. So I'm going to say negative, I'm going to say negative L zero plus 0 .0, 0 0.01, zero. Okay, so that means that this vector is going to be, uh, negative 0.083 in the y direction, right? Because the top's at 0, 0, 0. And you may think that is so silly to do it that way, but it's not, and I'll prove it later. Okay, I'm not gonna prove it in this video. I'm gonna prove it later. So that's my r value. I also need to, to put an initial momentum. So let's say it starts from rest. So I'm gonna say p equals m times vector 0, 0, 0. So if I wanna change the velocity, I don't have to change the whole momentum. That's right there. Uh, next, I need to do the time, t equals 0, dt equals 0 0.01. So we're looking good there. Now, I think I'm ready to do the loop. So I'm going to say while t less than 4. I don't know why I picked 4. If it's not long enough, that's fine. Uh, now, the first thing I need to do is to calculate L. Okay. So what is the vector L? It's, from, it's the vector from the top point to the position that I'm at right now. So I'm going to say L equals R minus top. Does that make sense? Now I can calculate the net force. I'm going to do this in one line because I think we're all grown ups here. F net equals M times G plus, and remember that's a vector, G is a vector, plus actually minus K times L, the magnitude of L, which would be mag L, minus L zero, and then I need to multiply that by L hat. So it's going to be times norm L. The norm is the unit vector of L built in. So that's it. That's F net. Now the next thing I'm going to do is update the momentum. P, P equals P plus F net times delta T. And remember here, this is a make equal to sign. It says take the old momentum, add F net times delta T, and make that the new momentum. So I don't have to do P1, P2, P3, and all that stuff. Next thing I'm going to do is update the position. R equals R plus P1 
times dt divided by m, because I need the velocity, so p over m is the velocity. And finally, I need to, actually I'm actually gonna plot it next, and then I'll update the time. So I'll say f1.plot, and I wanna plot t versus, I cannot do t versus r. I can do t versus uh, the y component of r. So I can say y.r, I think that's good. And then I'll update time, t equals t plus dt. I'm gonna save it, and let's see if this works. Check that out. Okay, but we're not done yet. We're not done because remember in the video, I measured the spring constant at 0 0.8, I don't remember what it was right now, 0.87 something? I'll quote. Well, let's just say it's 0.87. Uh, so how do I find the period here? Uh, let me point out the first thing. The first thing is, if you looked at this function, it looks like a cosine. It's, it is a cosine, okay? And there is no cosine or pi's or anything in this calculation, but you still get a cosine. So doing this, we still get a fairly nice model for the motion of that mass. Uh, let's, but I can get the period just by looking at this graph, right? I, I can actually measure things on the graph and I think that's gonna be the easiest. So it starts up here at the highest point, it goes down and back up. And if I put my cursor right over the top right there, I get, oh my goodness, I get about the same thing. And that other way I measured it was pretty non-accurate, but I get, this is pretty close enough to being good, right? I'm, I think you should be impressed because it, run the first, it ran the first time. Um, the other important thing to notice is that I gave this, uh, there is a gravitational force in this. This is not an easy problem to solve uh, with these two forces. I mean, it's not impossible, but it's not trivial either. Uh, but, but we still solved it. We get the motion of this. And it agrees with real life. So that is important. Let's just do one other thing. What if I, what if I uh, change this? What if I make it a two centimeters down? What's gonna happen here? you'll notice that I get a bigger amplitude, but the period is the same. So the period does not depend on the amplitude of the oscillation. Uh, what if I switch this back to 0.1, and what if I change the time interval to 0.1? Now you'll notice it doesn't look so great. However, I still get a period that's not crazy bad. I mean, this is jagged and and barbaric, you may say, but it still kind of works, even with a terribly small, terribly large time interval. I can make the time interval even smaller, 0 0.001. Uh, it takes longer to run, uh, and I get about the same value, point maybe a little bit better. Okay, so smaller time intervals usually get it better, but if I made this time interval as small as 0 0.0000001, it wouldn't really gain me that, that much. Um, okay. So I will link this code, let's save it. I'll link the code down below and I'm gonna do something even better in the next video. In the next video, I'm gonna see what happens if I pull the mask to the side, not up and down, and we'll do that.